Father's God to thee, offer of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. Father, we ask for your protection upon our lives, particularly upon the life of this nation. Help us, Father, to become the nation that you created initially at the hands of patriots so long ago. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Love lifted me. Let's try his banner over uh, over me is love. His banner over me is love. He brought me to his banqueting table. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. is Lord of all. King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus is Lord of all. All my possessions and all of my life, Jesus is Lord of all. If that isn't love, our theme for the day is love. <laughs> he left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was a lonely hill of Golgotha, there to lay down his life for me. is dry there are no stars in the sky and the sparrow can't fly if that isn't love then heaven's a myth there's no feeling like this if that isn't love even Remembered the thief hanging by his side. He spoke with love and. Comfort. 
compassion. Then he took him to paradise. If that isn't love, the ocean is dry. There are no stars in the sky, and the sparrow can't fly. If that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this. If that isn't love. We're going to sing this one as just celebrating what the church is about, loving one another. We're family. As we travel this sod For I'm part of the family The family of God Thank you all for your good work up here oh. And we are we are going to look about how to build love into your life. If you're going to do a series on the home or the church, either one, you probably need to, uh, you kids can go to children's church. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> Great deal. <laughs> It needs to start somewhere. The foundation for everything that we're going to talk about over the next weeks is love. We have to have that. So we're going to take a, a good, solid look at how to build love into your life. And... I came up here twice to put this out. <laughs> We're going to be reading Scripture as we go along. Uh, the first one we'll be reading is 1 Corinthians 13, uh, in part anyway, and uh, just sharing in that. So we are, at this point in time, for those of you who are still with me, uh, going to have a word of prayer, please. Lord and God, we thank you for the opportunity to share from the Word, to, to look into our own personal lives with it shining the light on them. We pray, Father, that Your Spirit will work freely in our lives today. Lift us up. Bless everyone who's listening online. We, we thank You for them. We thank You, Father, for the opportunity to, to share with them in that way. Bless each of us here as well. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, many people in the church are good for nothing. I'm going to explain that to you. It works this way. I mean that when we work in the church, we must accomplish what God wants. And if we're doing the work of the church and claim to be doing the work of the church, then what we need to do is we need to have it be good and turn out that way. So 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, talks about that. It says just what I just said in a biblical context. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned and do not have love, it profits me nothing. 
You get what I'm saying? You can be good. That's what that passage says. For nothing. <laughs> no thing is good unless we are doing it in the way that God wants us to do. To preach, teach, shepherd, read, to have discipleship, to lead people, to, to sing, to give. None of that is of value unless we have love. Love is the principal thing in our lives as Christians. In fact, there's a passage that just simply says, God is love. So we need to work off of that and think off of that. Whatever we're doing, our whole duty in life is, first of all, to be filled with love, to be filled with God in that way. We have in Jesus a change in our lives. We have a new life in Him. The preacher was talking to a new family at church and he asked the wife, he said, uh, have you become a Christian? And she acted like she didn't quite understand what he was saying. And he said, uh, does Jesus live in your heart? And she was still kind of confounded by it. And he said, okay, does Jesus make you kind and loving in your home? And her husband behind him said, press that question, brother. <laughs> Sometimes we are good for nothing. <laughs> Jesus' challenge to all relationships is to have them founded on Him and to operate out of Him. If Jesus has come into us, He's supposed to have changed us. If we turn over to 1 John, and I can't get past 1 Peter. 1 John, the fourth chapter, verses 19 through 21. We love because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This commandment we have from Him, the one who loves God should love his brother also. If we're going to claim to love God, then we need to make good on loving our brother. We need to, to, to live in that way. If we do not relate to others as we should, we can honestly be said to not be following God. First John, back in the third chapter, the, the 10th verse says, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. See how critical that is? He just says there's two sides to it. You're either working for God or you're working for the devil. And the way that you tell is whether or not you love people and treat them in a loving manner. man stepped up to a, one of those machines that gives you your weight and fortune. And he plugged in a nickel and it went to twirling and working and he turned to his wife and said, hey, look at this. Look at this. This is really good. This says that I am brilliant, resourceful, and energetic and everything that I touch is going to turn to gold. And she looked at it and she says, got your weight wrong too. <laughs> Sometimes we approach things in that way and we are not kind to people. And people, especially in our home, are easy to forget about being kind and loving toward. Are you showing God's love from your life? We know God is love and we are to love everyone without exception. How? We are going to have some practical suggestions today. Did you get the paper that was in the back? Anybody? Go get the paper that's in the back. I'll explain what we're doing. 
Pass, pass it out. Give everybody one, even if they don't want it. Uh, bring a couple of pins. <laughs> Could you go out and make sure we get some pins? Is that on the table? With the, there's one paper on to sign up. It, uh, Okay, what happened to our... Never mind. <laughs> Dorothy, are those still down in the basement? No, oh, they're on the table out there. All of the papers. All of the papers? Okay, he's got them now. Come on in with them. You guys at home, run, get yourself a piece of paper and take notes. <laughs> I'm sorry for the, the break there, but they, they weren't supposed to be there. They were supposed to be in people's hands as they came in. Oh. oh. <laughs> That's one of the exciting things. Just just work those around. Uh, the, there's answers to questions. If you... <laughs> I have a briefcase down there, just if anybody doesn't know. I don't know why I have it. I never seem to wind up with what I want out of it here. We have a, a sheet that will sit out after the service. And if you have something that you miss, you can get to it and look at it. Let's make a prayer and devotional list on building love into your life is what's on that top line. Let's make a prayer and devotional list. And then we're starting that. You're all caught up. <laughs> just write devotional list if you have to up there. It doesn't have to be perfect. We're not grading it. We're just trying to provide an opportunity for people to study this. And then out of the result of our study, maybe attend classes for the next uh, several weeks on Sunday morning, 9.30 to 10.30, uh, where we will pursue the various areas in which we must be loving. And now that we've worked down to that, to build love into our lives, the f number one thing is we need to develop spiritual attractiveness. Develop spiritual attractiveness. God is love. We draw close to Him in serving with a heart of love. At the close of the wedding ceremony, I always say to a couple, the living Christ is here present. The closer you remain to Him, the closer you will be to each other. That is, I believe, the basis for everything that we've gone through in that. And then I say you're now pronounced husband and wife and you may kiss the bride that's what they've been waiting for we have the fruit of the spirit come into our lives and the first thing in that list is love there's a ton of other things joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness self-control those things go into it too but the holy spirit in your life is the one who can provide the love as a part of the things that you are doing and that you are are living out so we need to develop that spiritual attractiveness and being filled with the Spirit does that. God is in us, working in us. If we have Jesus remove our sin and our guilt, then we can have the things taken away that create ugliness. Our sin and guilt does. And we can be provided with something that is, is great. A loving heart toward God. Every one. This is not easy. This is not simple. It is as complicated, though, as being willing to stop in the middle of things where you know you're not doing the right thing, because God will make you aware of it, and start doing the right thing. I had a woman come out of church one Sunday and she'd heard a couple of people griping. And she came out and she said, I'm not coming back here. 
because I thought that this was supposed to be a place where we provided love and I didn't see any love in the complaints that were going around. We can upset home or church or any other area of life with a failure to love. We need to develop the spiritual attractiveness that love brings into our life. Don't you like to meet somebody that loves you? Oh, yeah. We need to maintain physical attractiveness. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, verses 3 and 4, it says, Let not your adornment be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry and putting on dresses. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. That's actually addressed to wives in that. I think it applies well across the lines. We should care about our physical appearance. There's nothing wrong with looking nice. Nothing wrong at all. Appearance has an effect on people and how they see us how they deal with us. It shows how we feel about ourselves as well. If we let ourselves go, we know that there may be something wrong. At church, you ought to look nice. Used to be we wore suits, and that went out. <laughs> We're down to shirt and slacks to preach in, and most people come in whatever's nice and it's good to be clean and smell good, too. I mean, you know, no, nobody's going to run up and give you a hug if, if, if the next time they see you and are ready to do that, they think back to the last one and it was unpleasant. So we, we ought to look nice. We're, we're meeting someone special here today. Jesus is in our midst because there's two or three gathered together in his name. We need to show respect to Him. In church, it's good and necessary that we look nice, that we smell nice, that we teach our kids to stay clean and nice. We need this in our marriage. Keep your partner feeling you think they're important enough to take care of things for them. I had a woman tell me one time, she said, he doesn't care about me at all. Kissing him's like kissing a hedgehog. <laughs> that would be kind of rough, wouldn't it? <laughs> we need to make our partner pleased with us, if at all possible. When we're dating, we do that, don't we? That's, that's, that's the foundation of it. Now, I've had some experience dating, some of it fairly recently when I, I dated Dorothy. Uh, when I came to call on Dorothy the first time, and she had never laid eyes on me, and I didn't know if she'd even open the door. But uh, I, I, I'm dressed as pretty much as I'm dressed now to meet her. Later on, I got sloppy, but <laughs> right then I was concerned about what she might think of me. <laughs> and uh, wanted to, to make a good impression. We all need to do that kind of thing. Going way back, my late wife Connie and I had a first date. We were going over into Baxter Springs, Kansas to a smorgasbord they have there. And uh, I called at her house and picked her up. I was out at church camp near Carthage, and she lived in Carthage, and so I picked her up, and we drove over there. And I tell you what, I really was embarrassed when I got to the house. I couldn't go back because I had a time I was supposed to be there. But I got in my car, and the air conditioner failed. I'm sitting in my car in a suit coat, and it's 90 degrees outside. And it was 110 inside that suit. I finally stopped for a moment, got the coat off, and then I noticed that I was showing signs of sweat <laughs> on the shirt. I went on and picked her up anyway, and she didn't reject me. But I was interested in looking decent for the lady. We need to be looking decent for the Lord. 
and for the people that we encounter. Now, the clothes aren't everything, and if you're putting on your best and you're coming, I don't care. There's no kind of list that we have to follow. But what we need to do is put a priority on how we dress and how we look. Uh, I had a man come up to me after preaching on some of this. He came up and he said, what are you going to do about my wife? I said, I'm not doing anything about your wife. He said, well, she runs around the house all the time. And looks like she just stuck her finger in a light socket. I don't know what that meant, but it must be that she was somewhat disheveled. Always we must try to make a decent appearance. Always. Why? Because it makes it easier to love us. We need to verbalize love. Everyone wants and needs love. I like the song, I Am Loved. And it says in there, I can risk loving you. Hebrews 10.25 says that our job is to build one another up in Christ within the church. That would apply to our marriage as well. We can risk loving. We can build people up. We can exhort. A great church loves. Always a great church loves. God called no one to complain, but all to show love. You have to do that in the home. You have to do that with your kids. It's good to at least once a day say, I love you. Try it at bedtime. It's probably the only time you get them caught. <laughs> but do it. You'll both feel better for doing it. Do it with your spouse. They need to hear that. Dr. Tim LaHaye, in a meeting that I was in one time, told the story of a man who was well off. And he had a, a wife, and he had five children. And she came to Dr. LaHaye and said, I want you to know that my ref husband refuses to say the word love in my presence. And I don't know what to do. And Dr. LaHaye turned to him. He was standing right there and said, why don't you do that? He said, what do you want, woman? I give you money. I've given you a car. I've given you five children. Now, that shows you how men think. <laughs> you see, we need to express our love to our loved ones. And if we're not doing that, we're missing out on a good part of what life is supposed to be about. Express love physically. It says in the scriptures, greet one another with a holy kiss. In the church, a hand clasp, a hug around the shoulders maybe, a pat on the back. Touching says, you're important and I care about you. Marriage is about couples having a touching relationship. And how you do it is important. I spoke of that, that this came back to mind. I spoke of that, that date I had with Connie, first date. We, we arrive at the place where we're going to eat. Now, this place is known all over for its great food. But only half of their parking lot was paved, and there was a crowd. And so the overflow parking went to me. And we got out on gravel, and the gravel was this big around. And you know what that's like. And she was wearing a little bit of a heel. <laughs> and I was afraid that she was going to twist an ankle or something. So I reached out to take a hold of her arm to help her. And then I was kind of half embarrassed by it. So I grabbed her by two fingers and a thumb. <laughs> and just barely touched her so that if she started to fall, I could grab. She laughed at me for that. <laughs> The how of doing it and the commitment in doing it is important. We need to develop fellowship, and for fellowship requires that we touch. It requires that we touch. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. We need to be kind. To be kind. In marriage, that means courtesy. We look for ways to, to boost each other, to give an, a feeling of importance to the other person. In the church, we need to consider the needs 
of others. Try to help new people blend in. Share in the work with them. Help them develop in the fellowship. We need very much, very much, to show kindness to everyone we meet. 1 Corinthians 13 just says, Love is patient, love is kind. Continuing and picking up speed, I hope. <laughs> we need to be forgiving. Matthew 6 has Jesus talking about that. What does he say about forgiveness? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's not easy to forgive some things, creature. That's right. But we need to seek that loving relationship. We need to know that all is forgiven of us because that stands between us and them. And we need to know that all is forgiven of them because that stands between us and them. Now, let's be honest. I have to admit that my wife has need of being forgiven occasionally. I know I have to be forgiven a lot more often. Don't go there. <laughs> but that's part of loving her and caring for her is putting that aside. Get over it. It's about the best way to say it. Forgive others. God forgives and forgets. And when He forgets, He does it perfectly. And we need to be godly in that. We need to remove the hurt and the barrier that's created by the sin or the problem. There isn't any sin so great as it cannot be forgiven. Really? Well, yeah. Think about Jesus dying on the cross for all of it. It can be forgiven. Never carry a grudge, and especially don't carry a grudge to bed with you. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Get it over with before sunset. Otherwise, it won't leave you with pleasant dreams, I'm sure. Number seven in your list is be understanding. Matthew 7, 1. What does that say? Judge not that you be not judged. We must not condemn others. We must try to see their point of view. Realize most of the problems we have with other people is not something personal that they don't like us or something. It just has to do with our temperaments. We're different. Now, Dorothy grew up in a nice, middle-class American family. I grew up in a nice, middle-class American family. But they were two different operations. She had five siblings, I had two. That makes getting something to eat a strain sometimes. <laughs> We had differences in the things that we ate and the way we ate. We were told and taught that if you ate in somebody's house, you ate everything but maybe one bite to show that you had self-control enough to do that. In her house, if you didn't lick it clean, you were in trouble. <laughs> And when we got together, it was interesting discussing some of these things. It really was. But the key thing here is we need to be ready to understand the other person's situation. Connie, who I mentioned previously, my late wife, and I got along real good on everything except the first time we started to go on vacation. And we had a big old Mercury station wagon. And there was a place in the back end for two kids. So there was a seat between us. And they couldn't get their head up in there and start going. Yeah, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> it was really a good thing. And, but on top, it had a rack. And I loaded a tent on it. And she was horrified. And she had never spent a night in a tent. I said, well, where we're going, we're going out west. And there may or may not be places to sleep, you know, available. And we're going to be in some small towns where we may not be able to get anything. We can just go into 
some kind of a uh, tenting village or something and pitch tent and spend the night. They have nice, clean restrooms. She said, are you sure? I said, well, I've been in them and they had them clean. So we are driving and we got up into the Dakotas. Do you know that they have a motorcycle rally there, rally there every year? Uh huh. That was the weekend. <laughs> it was the time. When we got in there, and there was not. It, it was 8 o'clock at night, and there wasn't a, a room for miles. I talked to one of the, the people about it uh, that was waiting on people, and he said, there, there's nothing. He said, we've called to try to find places to put people out, and we haven't been able to find anything. He said, you're out of luck. You're just going to have to keep driving. I thought, man, I can't. You know, it was late. And so I pulled into a motel that had a real nice front lawn and side lawn on it. And all the motel went that way. It was like they built their house and then turned it into an office and built this motel. I went in. He said, we don't have a room. I said, I don't need a room. I need a place to put my tent. He said, tent? I said, yeah, I can guarantee you I can put that tent up, I can stake it out, and I can pull it all out, and I will not leave a spot, and if I do, I'll pay you a fine or something. He charged me for one room in his hotel. <laughs> but we had a place to sleep that night, and she found out it wasn't too bad. But we always had that difference. And if she saw me getting the tent out, she'd go, you're really taking that, are you? <laughs> Yep, saved us once. <laughs> we need to understand that we're different. When they say opposites attract, they hit the nail on the head. The way you do things, in case you hadn't noticed, oftentimes is not the way that your partner does things. In church, it makes it somewhat difficult sometimes because we all come from different ways of approaching things. Another thing, avoid comparisons. And I'm going to run a tad over, but I'm down to one, two, three things. And they only fill a small part of a page. <laughs> First John 4, verses 10 and 11 is important to us. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and set His Son to be the propitiation for our propitiation. I, did, I can say that. For sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, when we do that, we have to accept people as they are. We have to accept the kids are all different. I can remember my mother running through the house yelling, Why can't you be more like your... And would name my brother or sister. <laughs> a comparison like that shows a lack of love and it builds fear that we might be rejected. In marriage, when we start doing comparisons, we put ourselves in trouble. There was a man who had a wife who nagged him to be like the neighbor. Look, look how he dresses. Look how he acts. Went on and on and on about him. Well, he got tired of it and he hired a private eye. Had the guy check up on him. The next time she started saying, why can't you be more like him? He said, do you really want me to read this? Handed her the report. He'd had three affairs in the last year. Not exactly what she bargained for. The grass is always greener. We need to avoid comparisons. At church, we need to do that as well. You know, there are preachers that are looking for the perfect church. I've had friends that just jump church to church to church to church to church. I don't want a perfect church. I love you all. <laughs> and guess what? There are churches that look for the perfect preacher if you're looking for that. You missed on it and you know it. For some, it's a difficult thing not to compare and work to the end of, well, this is not perfect. This is not. We love despite the blemishes 
on the church or on the people. We need, if we're loving, to be patient. Love is patient, it says in 1 Corinthians 13. It hangs on to others. It doesn't necessarily have to blow up at the kids, you know. You can, you can handle that much better if you don't do that. And let, let me share this real quickly. Junior bit the meter man. Junior hit the cook. Junior is antisocial now, according to the book, Modern Psychology. Junior smashed the clock and lamp. Junior hacked the tree. Destructive trends are treated in chapters two and three. Junior threw his milk at mom. Junior screamed for more. Notes on self-assertiveness are found in chapter four. Junior tossed his shoes and socks out into the rain. Negation, that is normal. Disregard the strain. Junior set dad's shirt on fire. Upset grandpa's plate. Grandpa seized a slipper and yanked Ju Junior across his knee. He goes by the Bible for child psychology. Parental wisdom consists of bringing your children up, not sparing the rod and spoiling the child, but disciplining, and that sometimes is part of it. Disciplining. And do it to the point that somebody else will like your child besides you. <laughs> we need to learn patience in being loving. I'll give you one on me. I have a problem talking to other drivers. They don't hear me, but I talk to them. <laughs> And actually, you know, when I'm doing that, I've just started to come to grips with this. My impatience is selfishness. Why do I want them to hustle? Because they're blocking the road. Because they're interfering with my style, which is pretty fast in a car sometimes. We need to be patient so that the love shows. Last thing is communicate. Is that the last thing? No, it's not. Communicate. Be friendly with each other. Plan time with your kids and refuse to let anything take you out of it. Play with them. Develop communication in playing with them. In marriage, spend time alone with your spouse. Leave your troubles with a sitter. You know who your troubles are. And go. Evaluate your marriage together with time spent in prayer, with time spent in devotion. We need time to do things. Sometimes maybe you just need to take a walk. We need strengths to our children in our home and also point out strong points and encourage their development. We need to have marriage be a place where praise for what is good exists. And like I say, my wife has never stopped me from complimenting her. I like to tell her how good it is that she turned down, th I turned down thousands of other offers just to be with her. Uh, <laughs> I don't do that. We need to praise the church in the same way. Build one another up in love, it says in Ephesians 4.16. So much is right with the church. We need to quit talking about what is wrong and talk about what is right. Focus on the things that are right and look for a way to change the things that are wrong. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. If I did that too fast for you, I at least got through before I got to longer time periods than this. I will put this out 
uh, on the table at the back. If you have something you missed and you'd like to get it down, it'll be your opportunity to do that. If you like me doing this, I will do it through this entire series, and we'll remember to put things out where they need to be <laughs> to do it. Let's offer an invitation. It's offered in the name of Christ, our Lord. It is an opportunity now coming up for us to make a public decision if we want to choose to do that. If you're out there, you can take down that number just right now. Pop it into your phone. And when you submit your text, then we will respond to you with a text and then with a phone call or whatever it is that you particularly need. Let's sing the invitation song. split communion song we're going to sing I love you Lord and then following the communion we're going to sing another song that's maybe something we should focus on because when we meet around the Lord's table we're supposed to be examining ourselves how am I doing Lord how am I doing it's a good question to ask make me aware of it help me to understand it Help me to understand what I need to do at home, at church, out in the world every day. We're going to start off singing just to our Lord, I love you. Supper, we want to say, we love you, Lord. We want you to know that. We want to be aware of the love that we share with you. Bless us now as we think about that love at Calvary. We pray in the name of our crucified, resurrected Lord. Amen. And so we partake of the representation of His love offering, the bread representing His body. And then we partake of the cup representing His blood shed for our sin. Next song up, please. We should have an examination time at communion. That's what we're referring to with this.
Amen, Lord. We intend to serve you as we go out because we love you. I will set this on the table in case you have something you want to check up on because sometimes I, toward the end of that, I was blowing by him. I, that's more points than I ever had in a sermon in my life. <laughs> and... Uh, invite your comment. I won't necessarily do it all the time, but I'll do it through this series. We're talking about running a class on Sunday morning starting next week. If you want to be part of a class that discusses marriage and the home and home life and things that we're focusing on, then sign up on the sign-up sheet and we'll put the class into effect. Just, just that simple and easy. Uh, and we'll spend an hour and it'll be open. Not open microphone, but just open talking because we'll be in a smaller group than that. But we'll, we'll, we will give people a chance to ask and talk about that. So it's on the table to sign up. Let's take a moment for closing prayer. Father, it's good to be here. We have many of our friends who are traveling and doing various things, and we pray for them and for their safety and for their return. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to share, to hear about love, which is supposed to be foundational in our lives. We, we understand. But sometimes, Lord, it's hard not to be selfish and then not be able to love like we should. Help us to learn to love as Jesus did, the one who gave himself on the cross. We pray in his name. Amen. each other we are love